The UN has recently recognized climate change as the defining issue of our time, and people are panicking about it. Right now, some people are ringing the alarm bells, stating that the apocalypse is near. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. While others feel we'll be just fine no matter what. The idea that Bill Nye is just going around saying CO2 is up, therefore global warming is dangerous, we should be concerned. It's not. It's not dangerous. What exactly is the truth about what's going on with our environment? And why are we so divided on this issue? Now to a dire warning about climate change. According to a new report, experts say that we have until 2030 to avoid catastrophe. Climate change, global warming, global cooling, we've heard it all. What's going on out there? Well, surface temperature of the planet is warmer than it was 100 years ago. About nine-tenths of a degree Celsius. Is that a lot? No, it's not a lot. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. But to embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. The United States, to the horror of the world, withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Was uh, Mr. Trump right to get out of this particular deal? Yes. Fundamentally, it would have done almost nothing for climate, and it would have been incredibly costly. Mm -hmm. So getting out doesn't actually do anything bad about climate, but it saves us a lot of money. Deeper still, we don't have to project one minute into our future to see that the climate crisis is already here. The differing perspectives on climate change are dizzying, even ones not motivated by political memes. That aside, what are the actual challenges we face? Are we accurately identifying them? Are we taking the right approach with solutions? 2030, CO2 emissions, gotta get them down by almost half. In the process, are we viewing the Earth as a mere machine made up of a sum of parts? Or are we recognizing the aliveness and connection throughout the planet? Actually, even if we cut greenhouse emissions to zero, if we continue to degrade the organs and tissues of our living Earth, the planet will still die a death of a million cuts. The truth is, we are viewing climate change and our environment in an extremely incomplete and ineffective way all in the name of maintaining the status quo. To protect our security and our economy. It's time for a new approach. But to do that, we must be willing to not only open our minds, but our hearts as well. I've been researching uh, our environment and climate change for almost 10 years now, and it seems like these days we're being asked to forget about the environment as a whole, and instead we're focusing just on the climate. The, the issue with this, and speaking just about the climate, is that we begin to isolate our view of complex ecosystems to what we think are the most important parts, and unfortunately we can't accurately view the state of our environment and how to change it as a whole when we look at things in this manner. Through government policy and mainstream media, carbon dioxide, or CO2, has become the focus when it comes to climate change and environmental degradation. In the process, we argue over just how much an effect CO2 really has on our environment. What Bill and I just did was waste everyone's time explaining that CO2 is rising. The question is, what impact does CO2 have on the weather? What impact does CO2 have on climate change? We also argue over whether its rise is part of natural cycles or caused by human activity. The claims are that the science is settled on this issue and that we know exactly how bad things truly are. When you throw around a, a, a statement like the UN says it's not the hottest 20 years, I really, I gotta disagree with you. But in reality, the CO2-focused science is daunting and you will find studies that support many different narratives when it comes to carbon and its effects. 
I worked for UN committee for two years on sustainable economic and ecological development and read a very large amount during that period of time. And the climate change issue is an absolutely catastrophic, nightmarish mess. And um, first of all, it's very difficult to separate the science from the politics. This leads to the crux issue that most politicians, mainstream media, and governments aren't sharing with the public. We are reducing why and how our environment is degrading down to one main factor, carbon emissions. Even though this is an incredibly ineffective and incomplete way of viewing the subject. Current policy and rhetoric and thinking about climate change is still heavily influenced by what I call the geomechanical view which sees Earth as this fantastically complicated, wonderful machine. That way of thinking leads us to believe that if we could tinker with the air-fuel mixture of our diesel engine, we could get it running properly. So the paramount issue becomes levels of greenhouse gases. The paramount metric becomes CO2 or temperature or something like that. And something as, as complex as planetary health gets reduced to a linear measure. That, in my view, is a terrible mistake. Before we ask the question as to why the strategic focus on CO2 is happening, let's explore why this reduction doesn't work. When talking about systems, it's a common Western mentality to view everything mechanically, through reductionism. Let's look at a simple mechanical system, for example. In this system, the relationship between parts is linear or directly connected, making the system very predictable. A car is an example of a simple mechanical system. Many parts are organized together to produce a moving vehicle. When a part breaks, the car may stop working. You can then troubleshoot to find out what part broke, replace that part with a predictable outcome. In a mechanical system, we can reduce the whole into smaller parts that we can then focus on one at a time. In a complex or organic system, a living system if you will, parts are a little more independent of one another, yet still connected. So when you adjust one part, you'll likely get an unpredictable result because parts are organic and they adapt, they're not mechanical. An easy example of this is looking at the human body. The human body is a complex living system, but in modern medicine, we view it as a sum of parts that we can treat individually. We treat the liver with no thought of how it affects the heart. We treat the heart with no thought of how it affects the kidneys. This is why we have side effects associated with our treatments, because we view the body mechanically, avoiding the connection that exists between each part in an organic system. Our environment is a complex organic system, yet modern society is viewing it as a mechanical set of parts that we can adjust individually. The dangers of viewing it this way is that when we start to adjust things based on the premise of just CO2, we are going to be doing things where we can't predictably understand how the environment as a whole is going to change or adapt to all the synthetic adjustments we make in trying to fix the environment. If we continue to degrade and destroy the forests, especially the primary forests, uh, the wetlands, the seagrass meadows, 80% of the New England seagrass meadows are gone. The mangrove swamps, half of them in Southeast Asia are gone. The coral reefs, the kelp forests, the whales, the soil, the fish. Like if we continue to, these are organs. These are organs of a living being. And the, the living being will will become unhealthy and sick if we continue to do that. Environmentalists are often leading with their hearts, but when they believe CO2 reductionism is still leading in the right direction, efforts are lost as focusing on CO2 can make us think we are solving our environmental destruction by reducing emissions, when in reality we are not. It also motivates poor and unpredictable decisions, like geoengineering, which artificially sprays millions of tons of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, with no idea of its total effects. It would look something like this. 
Thousands of planes would fly very high and use nozzles to inject millions of tons of light reflecting particles into the stratosphere. It would create a thin chemical cloud of those particles around the whole planet, blocking some sunlight from reaching the surface. It would mimic a giant volcanic eruption. But putting everything on CO2 does the following. It alleviates, and this is a big distraction, Monsanto gets away, pollution gets away. Bringing, so get, bringing back, what should we really do with climate change? Focus on lowering pollution. Seven, the number one cause of death in the world is air pollution. Seven million people die every year. And the Paris Accords allowed China to pollute another 11 billion more tons. So think about it. So how is that lowering pollution? So they allow pollution increase. And guess who's one of the big people behind the CO2 hypothesis? Monsanto. From a practical standpoint, with CO2 as the focus and reducing emissions as the marker of our success, our decisions come from that point of view. This results in ignoring overall pollution and degradation, and instead ranking wetlands, forests, fish, and oceans by how much they impact carbon emissions versus their true role in the environment as a whole. So here's a great example of, of, of you know, setting our marker points based on just CO2. You have a logging company who decides that they're going to clear cut a forest and they get permission to do so, so long as they replace the trees that they're gonna remove because hey, now you have carbon neutrality and you're replacing the sequestering possibilities. What we're not looking at is that the forest itself and the destruction of it starts to create drier conditions. It starts to change the way soil erosion happens. You're upsetting the natural balance that occurs within that isolated ecosystem that includes intelligence that manages pests, that manages the way things function as a whole. So while you are saying to carbon neutrality, hey, you know, by replacing this forest, we're still sequestering the same amount of carbon, we're not actually looking at the magic that exists within the being of a forest and all the small details that once you ignore begin to collapse that ecosystem as a whole and it no longer functions in the way that it originally naturally did, i.e. the synthetic way of coming in and adjusting it doesn't produce the same result we had before we clear cut the forest. You may be thinking, this won't happen. Those in charge are smarter than to focus key decisions solely on carbon. Well, it's already happening. Companies are already touting that GMO crops, for example, could sequester carbon and save the planet. And yet we all know the dangers and destruction GMOs cause on health and the environment. Further, even our oceans are already being ranked by their carbon sequestering power as opposed to the full value they offer to the environment. In a report, the Global Ocean Commission roughly estimates that fish and other aquatic life in the high seas absorb enough carbon dioxide to avert 74 billion to 222 billion in climate damage per year. One author of the report even stated, I really think to use our oceans sensibly, we need to look at all of the services that they provide and then find those that contribute to human welfare and well-being the most and try to encourage that. If you haven't figured it out yet, yes, the prevailing wisdom of academics and government today is suggesting we rank animals and nature based on their value to us and their impact on our carbon plans, then encourage taking care of the highest ranked ones the most as if this won't affect the delicate balance. One of the other challenges with the carbon focus is that while I personally love seeing deer run in my backyard and enjoy the land, well, if they don't sequester carbon enough, maybe they don't have enough value to make sure that we keep the ecosystems that they thrive off of alive. Yes, this is a simplified view, I understand that, but not only are we not looking at the true connectedness of everything, we've reduced the deer or anything else really down to a mere number down to how it serves our climate plans not the beauty that it provides the heart in seeing and experience it as well as how it's connected within the entire ecosystem as a whole
It's important to note why political elites have chosen to focus on CO2 as the main narrative. 1. We can measure it and thus propose action based on it. 2. Through reductionism, they can manipulate mass perception. 3. Because of the latter two reasons, we can find what to blame and go to war on it, while at the same time not upset our current economy or general world views. Simply, focusing on carbon emissions is the easiest way to maintain the status quo. When you make things about politics, being a progressive or conservative, you start to distract people from the real truths that political elites are working so hard to make sure that people don't see and question. And those are, one, our relationship to the land, and two, the very foundation of how our society is strategically limited, controlled, and enslaved, which is the economy. In our current way of thinking, or consciousness today, we seem to think that nature is valuable based on its usefulness to humans. Look at how we view the economic impact of climate change. Climate change and our environmental challenges are one of the biggest existential threats to our way of life. In an article titled, An Intensifying Climate Crisis, threatens more than half the world's GDP, authors were able to place a dollar amount on the services nature provides to the global economy. The report found that 44 trillion of economic value generation, more than half of the world's GDP, is moderately or highly dependent on nature and its services. It goes on to further say, this report shows how exposure to nature loss is both material to all business sectors and is an urgent and non-linear risk to our collective future economic security. Unfortunately, we have used the knowledge that we've gained through this relationship that we call science in order to dominate and control and to turn nature toward our short-term narrow purposes. But it doesn't have to be used that way. Even the World Wildlife Foundation has quantified the value of the world's oceans within the global economy. A 2015 report titled, Reviving the Ocean Economy, concluded that our oceans are worth at least $24 trillion. It further stated, the oceans are our natural capital, a global savings account from which we keep making only withdrawals. To continue this pattern leads one place, bankruptcy. It is time for significant reinvestment and protection of this global commons. We are reducing land, life, oceans, and nature to mere numbers within an economy, which leads to its degradation. Are we going to realize the elephant in the room that our economy is disconnected from nature and so are we? It's our relationship with nature that needs to change. In the context of the economy, you'll often hear that, you know, we can't afford to make these changes, right? Who's going to pay for things to adjust? We can't afford the economic cost of using higher quality materials. And sometimes people are right. But as the companies feel the pinch to do these things, are they motivated by their love for nature to create changes? Or is it motivated by their profits, their need to stay alive within the economy? You know, perhaps a company will cut emissions and meet the Paris Accords, but then they begin dumping waste into a nearby river or using lower quality materials to save money and keep people employed. Agreements are met, but there's more garbage and waste in the environment. It's why planned obsolescence is a thing. It's why every product that we seem to buy every year gets worse and worse and worse. It's not that these companies are evil per se, it's that they're existing within an economy that's designed for limitation, scarcity, and to do these things in this particular manner. Living with a mindset of scarcity that creates an economy built on scarcity will keep us repeating the same pattern over and over because we are inherently limiting the world that is truly possible, not only by our thinking, but by the systems we create out of that thinking. By focusing on CO2 and choosing not to upset our markets, 
we don't ever adjust the relationship we have to the land. Why do you love animals and nature? Is it because they are worth something? Because they provide you utility? Is it because you eat them or use them to keep warm? Is it because they allow you to make money? Remember the studies from the wildlife organizations we spoke about before? Are the people involved in those studies who quantify everything via numbers and dollar figures evil? Or are they merely acting from a mindset and a way of being that is modern, yet blinded from the real solutions we are being asked to recognize? When we get out of the way and stop damaging Earth so much through our current ways, it begins to actually regenerate. It has the ability to do this. And we can participate in having our relationships support that regeneration versus just supporting our current economic ways and ways of doing things. But in order to make that actually happen in the long term, we have to address and make popular the idea that it's our relationship with nature that needs to change, not the short-term solutions that we keep proposing that are systematic. And I want all of us to start asking that question. What is our service? What is ours to do? In the near term, I think it's obvious. In the near term, it is what I said, to protect, preserve, regenerate life on Earth. This is about returning to a deep knowing that we are greatly connected to nature. We must recognize that maintaining the status quo is not the answer, and adjusting details within our current systems via reductionism, making sure we maintain the economy in the process, is what we are being asked to change. This change in thinking, this shift in our relationship, isn't just about you know, focusing on the environment or protecting nature or just getting rid of the economy. It's about fully changing our ways to create a society without limitation, built on abundance and harmony with everything. It's our consciousness, our way of thinking and seeing the world that is at the forefront of what needs to change at this time. We have traded abundance, thrivability, unlimited innovation and connection to nature for markets, scarcity, and economic competition. But we made up the trade and we can trade it back at any time. When we do, we'll watch our ways change and nature will begin to regenerate.